space on the next page another way of stating the same thing might be what Perry says about patriarchy. Speaking again in reference to Locke, the rule of the father as an absolute authority was too limiting to his project of creating free citizens. Patriarchy can't be so simple as something that happens around a patriarch. Because then all you have to do is dispense with the patriarch and you've dispensed with the patriarchy. Patriarchy again works as a relationship and many different figures can occupy many different positions in that relationship at many different times. It's designed to be flexible. If it weren't flexible, it wouldn't last. In a sense, it wouldn't work. And finally, she talks about virtue, civic virtue as we think of it. And she points out that Locke and those who follow Locke have a very uh, sophisticated, well-developed sense of civic virtue. But it is virtue that's deliberately limited, or as she puts it, Virtue demands public loyalty only to the civilized, not to the savage or the privately held. Property is the limit on loyalty and it's also the limit on liberty. Now we're in a place where there's some interior tension created by the text I've joined together. Because it might not be apparent what Perry has to do with Miseres and with Mato. But one of my questions that I'm asking myself as I'm trying to understand Mato, because the whole impetus of this for me was trying to understand this text by Mato and to make sense of it, is what is the role of work in these relationships of property? And what is the role of work in generating personhood? And to what degree is Mato still working within a system that is going to produce personhood based on unpersonhood. And to what degree is she proposing some sort of an alternative? And I've come to you without even having an answer to all these questions. These are, this is something I'm actually working on now. So this is, this is the question that I'm asking and, and I don't know the answer to it. I think I'm still okay in my time frame, right? Because I'm ready to leap to text number four. Okay, Vestrini. What in the world does a Venezuelan author from the 1970s have to do with this talk about John Locke and quoting the Mato? The text that you all have read um, was a text that was not published in Bestrini's lifetime. And I haven't done the archival work necessary. I'm not sure if anyone has to know exactly when it was written. She died in 1991. Uh, she committed suicide. Uh, and left a couple of notes. Um, she was not a forgotten poet. She was the culture editor of um, El Nacional, which certainly during her time was the most important newspaper in Caracas, uh, founded by Miguel Otero Silva. She um, was a widely published poet at a moment when Venezuelan poets were being read all over the world, uh, a moment of a, a lot of poetic fervor and movements in Venezuela. This poem, the, the tone of despair, um, holding the world at arm's length and thinking of the position of the poet as something that comes from being in a liminal position where you might be out of the world completely or just barely on the edge of it is very important to her work. In that sense, this poem is not an anomaly. She's written lots of poems that also contain that theme. One of the things that's interesting about this poem to me, especially if you read the English along, alongside the Spanish, the Spanish, the repeated phrase is el día después. And in English, it's translated logically as the next day. It is my belief, though I don't know, because of the allusion to an atomic explosion, that el día siguiente actually is her Spanish translation of another phrase in English, the day after. The day after was the name of a made for TV movie that premiered on ABC in 1983. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it. The movie depicts a nuclear war and what happens after the nuclear war. So it was an apocalyptic slash post-apocalyptic film that importantly was produced for network television in the US. So it was actually viewed on primetime TV by about 100 million people in 1983. 
And as the title would indicate, it deals with the social breakdowns that happen after an imagined nuclear exchange between the two superpowers. I believe that that idea is at the foreground um, of this text. And one of the things that Bestrini suggests in the text is she creates the poets as an office or a special social category. Uh, again, we're still in the territory of Obreras del Pensamiento. And she says that, to put it one way, the fire is no surprise to the poets. Those that welcome the fire like a logical inheritance from a traitorous memory are the poets. Other people are surprised by the fire. The poets welcome it, uh, always remembering it. And then finally, in the last line, she calls the power of the poets, the negation or escape from the world, as the power of the silent nothing. So there's an idea of generating subjectivity from the office of the poet by liminal outsider status vis-a-vis -vis an industrialized world that is in fact planning its own destruction. When we think apocalypse now, we're probably more likely to think in terms of climate, say. If you were going to make the day after now, you'd probably make it. It wouldn't exactly be a nuclear war between the Soviet Union and the US. It would be something else. But this idea that the industrial motor goes toward its own destruction, and you achieve personhood by rejecting that, or being on the edge of it, or even by understanding its inner mechanism in a way that's not clear to everyone else, seems like yet another approach to this problem. And that's it. I'm coming to you with unanswered questions about unanswered questions. And I would love to hear other people's thoughts uh, on these texts. Thank you so much, Ronald. This is, um, this is great. Thank you so much for giving us this insight and and all these texts and putting them together i was really curious of how you would do this <laughs> um and i'm also curious to hear everybody's thoughts i, I suggest that we all um whoever wants to um be in the discussion turns on their camera yes also there's yuri i want to mention this quickly yuri was actually the one to introduce me and ron basically so it's also thanks to him that we're all here together. This is great. Thank you so much. Um, now, um, back to the texts. If anyone has um, anything burning on their souls right now and direct answer to Ron's presentation, you can always show up and join into the discussion. If not, I can quickly share my reading. I was obviously... Um, also, I mean, thank you so much for sharing those texts of um, Florina Mato de Turner that I didn't know. And um, I was actually kind of disappointed because it's, the, it's already 19, um, in the 20th century that she's giving these talks. And it's very, um, it's very, you know, it's very disillusioning to see how she addresses women and, that she's she's being very modest about this whole idea she's i was i was right like impressed of how much she tries to tame all the socialist thoughts right i don't yes. know if you can yeah so so go ahead yeah so you can uh, react to that and then i can say more i, I was gonna say that's Part of, part of my own fascination with the text does uh, stem from that. Um, she actually uses a phrase in English, um, blacklister, uh, someone who's on a blacklist, which refers to the list that employers would make of employees who were suspected to be labor agitators. So that if someone is on the blacklist that is shared among owners, they know not to hire this person because this person will cause um, perturbaciones sociales. Um, if they come into your workplace. And she says something to the effect of, we want nothing to do with black listers, which I, I take to mean um, the whole enterprise of having a strike is, uh, is something she's rejecting. 
exactly and, so she's actually telling yes sorry and that's uh you know if you're if you're taking her from the perspective of you believe that the struggle of labor unions in the 20th century was an admirable thing then this is going to be a disillusioning thing to read obviously if, if you took another perspective then you might look at it differently and so i'm i'm taking that first perspective and so part of me is wondering to what degree and this is a technique that's probably used too much to read the text of 19th century women writers. The question of to what degree the text is being packaged for a certain audience. Uh, at, at some level, it becomes tiresome to say, I don't think they were really as retro as the text sounds. I think they thought their readers were retro. And so they had to make the text sound that way because it's like a big epicycle to explain the solar eclipse instead of just saying this is what happened um, at some level the intention uh, maybe doesn't even matter because what you've got is the text it's interesting to me that she seems to believe i don't think that what she thinks the result of this vision of socialism without strikes i don't think she sees it as a continuation of the status quo it may be naive or misguided to believe that anything but a continuation of the status quo is possible. But I think the place that Mato is coming from is that a more radical change that changes everybody in the way they see work and the way they see other people would do more than the singular instance of a strike, which I think everybody would agree, particularly if you're talking about the 19th century. Uh, Strikes and responses to strikes do occasion a lot of suffering for a lot of people who aren't involved in the strike. I, I don't think that's debatable. Um, and so at some level, she doesn't care whose fault that is. She doesn't want it to happen and she wants to propose progress uh, in a different way. And I was thinking about, and maybe this is, this is like a, an unfair anachronistic leap uh, a few years ago, I read uh, Stefan Zweig's memoir um, that he wrote in Brazil uh, when he was in exile uh, during the Second World War. I don't know if, if, if you all are familiar with Stefan Zweig, uh, Austrian author who's most famous for biographies of artists that he wrote that were bestsellers. But the, the memoir that he wrote in 1941, he was a shattered person in many ways, and many of the people he knew were being killed in the Holocaust at that very moment. And the most poignant sort of historical or dramatic irony in the text actually happens when he talks about the months before World War I versus World War II, because he was in Vienna in 1914. And describing the summer of 1939, he said it was a really beautiful summer, exactly like the summer of 1914 in Vienna. He said, and what's really hard to believe is before August 1914, a lot of us believe that warfare itself was simply going to age out of human society. That the idea of having a big war was impossible to imagine. Easy to say that in Vienna in 1914, not so easy to say it in other parts of the world, no doubt. But I do wonder if there is a kind of hope for large scale progress that's going to move everything in a certain direction. Um, that from our own historical vantage point seems completely impossible. And that was maybe equally implausible in that time, but maybe not so obviously impossible. That's just a guess or a speculation. It's, it's also maybe worth pointing out that um, Christian socialism was really a thing in Europe in the 1840s. And, and there's a bunch of discourse about socialism that comes well before Marx. Um, you can find people in the United States who are left of the dial politically in the 1850s being accused of being socialists, believe it or not. Like it's, it's an old tactic and it goes back to Fourier and Saint-Simon and Robert Owen. And, and, and you could also cite Flora Tristan who in, in, her, in her turn is cited by Marx, who's an example of she has a communitarian model in which the union is like a community center that workers contribute to voluntarily that pools its capital. It's a completely independent uh, operation. 
that basically becomes as big and bad a capitalist as the employer, because that's what's necessary. And this is around 1840 that she's writing that. So there's, so I, I, it's possible that our own vision of what socialism is or could be is rather narrow compared to what socialism might have seemed to be in 1900, when there were many, many different things that were all calling themselves socialism. Sorry, what were you gonna say? No, 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 this is great. I think this is actually, you just answered this, um, uh, the, my, my question, because I, this is why I was so disappointed, right? Because Flora Tristan publishes her, her um, socialist text, L'Union Ouvrière in 1843, I think. And then um, more than 50 years later, Claudine Namato Turner writes this text where she's pushing back all those initiatives, basically, and um, writing about, yeah, and like also in the other text, she's criticizing all the different anarchistic um, um, movements in Peru. So whenever something is falling apart or destructive, she calls it anarchist, which I yes. think was obviously answering to those debates. But yeah. then, um, yeah. but then my question maybe would also be, I mean, we can we can also um, now come back to all the other super interesting questions that you started to pose, but. My question while I was reading this was really like trying to figure out how to um, navigate um, Claudina Mato Turner and her also um, in her texts that are going more into a direction of, you know, indigenista texts like um, yeah. Ima Sumac and, and all of that. And she also mentions all kinds of, she's very familiar with um, um, Quechua, Quechua values, although those were later critical criticized as also having been imposed by um, colonial Spanish morals. Yes. Um, but um, but yeah, I was just thinking like how to, like she seems to be um, a little conservative in terms of feminist questions. She seems to be a little conservative writing, reading this text from an ahistorical perspective in terms of um, questiones del obrero, del obrera, the, of workers' rights. But um, I also understand your point that you're saying actually Christian so socialism sh can be read as, as a critique of capitalist exploitation. Yeah. And, um, and, um, and, and this whole idea of the author as a worker can be read as some sort of an anticipation of what, what, was, what would later probably be literature engagé with Sartre, et cetera. I don't know if you would go that far, but you know, it's like going the direction that that intellectual thought is considered as something very basic, very down to earth and very, um, yeah, with this, something that has this power of action. So- um, There's another, and I, 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 I don't wanna do uh, contextual deus ex machina where I, I come in with a heretofore unmentioned contextual detail that, that neatly explains everything. But it is, I, I do think it's important the circumstances under which Clarina Mato left Peru. Um, there was a golpe de estado in 1895 in which um, uh, General Cáceres, who was a friend and protector of, uh, of Clarina Mato, but no Democrat uh, in, by any means, was overthrown by Nicolás Pierola. And historically, from the lens of 2021, I think you could say that Pierola's instincts were much more democratic than Cáceres were. Though I think you could also reasonably say that that was not apparent in 1895 when the golpe de estado took place. And one of the things that happened was her house was literally ransacked by Pierola's people. And so, she leaves under that cloud. The very first place she goes is Chile, which has just fought a devastating war with Peru a few decades earlier. And she writes a bunch of things sort of destined to be conciliatory. And then she goes to Buenos Aires. So perturbación social is not like a distant abstract concept for her. It's something that's real. And it doesn't necessarily follow that a golpe de estado even if the person being golpeado is, has, has leadership that is imperfect, anti-democratic, or even unjust, it's not apparent to her that that equates to progress. 
later she, she writes some things that are sort of quasi conciliatory about Pierola, but that's several years later when Pierola has agreed to have elections. So I do think, I do think there's a, there is very little faith in the idea that disturbios sociales are going to lead to, pro, to progress in her vision. And I think it's also true that the thing that, she, that most got her in trouble as a publisher was publishing a story that the Catholic Church deemed offensive. And she was excommunicated by a bishop for that. But there, was a, there were also attacks that were very public that were made on her and popular. So I don't think it was just a question of elites being opposed to that. So I, I think it's complicated. I think her relationship with um, popular social movements is complicated. I think she's distrustful of Pueblo. I don't know how else to put it. She doesn't want to be. Um, part of her isn't and part of her is. And those, those instincts are going in different directions. Yes, Yuri, maybe just before, just uh, as a very quick answer. I think what what is also appalling in her text is that it's sometimes you can hear this when she's writing, right? She's like talking to poor workers and say, working women and saying that well, you shouldn't be envious of rich people. I mean, this is something very <laughs> problematic. And for me, obviously, as a like coming from a German perspective and reading something like work is liberating, Of course, it's extremely yeah. problematic. Yes, yes, of course. Like post Holocaust, um, obviously, and then also um, her whole um, um, the the whole phrasing that she does around progress, and then she's also she is valuating the Tawantinsuyu system and the Incayan system, but then she also admires all the uh, Spanish um, conquerors, etc. And then she totally contributes to this whole idea of progress. Why? Whereas from a decolonial perspective we might want to question the whole idea of progress in general, right? She's But a disappointing decolonialist. I mean, <laughs> yes. as, as, I, I think that's fair. I mean, I think that the problematic nature, I think that's one of the things that makes her interesting to study now in a way because of the, of the difficulty of placing that. But I agree, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think the question about work, um, You know, it's, it depends on how you look at it at that too. It's, it's easy to talk about work when you're the one profiting off the work, right? Like every, you know, if I, I can be the owner and deeply appreciate in an emotional way the work everybody else is doing to make me rich. Like that, there's probably no more sincere appreciation than that perhaps, um, which is not the same thing as sharing in their struggle or being on the same level that they are. On the other hand, the idea that the value of something is tied to the work that goes into it rather than its speculative value on the market is a pretty classically left idea uh, as much at that time as right now. So I, I think it depends on what you're emphasizing. You to go ahead, sorry. Hi, thank you everyone for your, your presentation. And actually this is a question out of, uh, more like a curiosity based out of your comment on Stephen Zweig in like the summer of 1914. Uh, I was curious if, if, if you see in Clorinda, if you can expand a little bit more like the role of like the vision about war. Uh, do you think that you're suggesting that Clorinda also had the same, Clorinda Mato de Turner also had the same uh, notion of this sense of like maybe war will cease to exist um, coming from an experience of like wars in Latin America? I'm just curious about how, if, if you can expand a little bit more on that. I think it was an interesting proposition. Uh I think there is a definite anti-war stance, uh, including the Mato in general. Like there's, there, is a, there is a lack of comfort with war. And again, she's experienced firsthand a war that was a complete disaster for Peru, um, both militarily and socially. Uh, Peru put up an army against Chile that was badly under-equipped um, against a Chilean army that had been that had been armed by Germany, basically, by, by Prussia, that had, that had Krupp's cannons, as she puts it, describing the war. And, and the losses were horrific, and it, and it caused a bunch of reevaluations of Peruvian society, some of them racist, um, you know, some, some of them more profound. And so I, I do think there was a disillusionment with that. There's, there's not an idea of, if we could all just figure out what the right cause is and take up arms together, we can achieve it. 
like that could not be further from the mentality of Corinne de Mata. She, she, I think she sees nothing good uh, coming from that. And that, and that, I do think that's a factor. It, it would bear further investigation. Like I, it's a, it's a theory rather than something that I know. Amy, go ahead. Thank you, Professor Briggs. Thank you for this talk and the collection of texts. Um, I my question goes a little bit in a different direction because I've been really intrigued by this title, "The Poetics of Personhood," as the yes. as, as your way of uniting all of these texts. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about that, um, kind of scoping out a bit and talking about what you see as the role of specifically poetry, right? And because Claudine de Matucci Turner is writing prose and giving speeches um, and it's a little bit different in the Vistrini. So maybe just more generally, what is the role of poetry in this like emergence of the non-person into personhood? Sure, uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, every part of the title comes from somebody else. Um, so the, uh, the thought work comes from Corinne de Mato. The personhood really comes from Imani Perry, like her, her theory about the generation of personhood. And it's not that you move in her formulation from non-personhood into personhood. And I actually think this is important. You create persons by creating non-persons. Like both are created at the same time and one depends on the other. She's making an argument that the Western regime of personhood is literally built on the non-personhood of others. Persons are those who command non-persons, uh, who bind but are not bound, to put it another way. And, that, and, and, and she sees that as, as fundamental um, to, the way, to the way personhood is. Before that, you would have something else, something that's, that's not necessarily classifiable by personhood or not personhood uh, from her um, perspective. Poetics, yes, I'm, I feel like I'm the, um, probably the kind of text I least like to deal with is the novel, which is interesting because we, we live in an, like in an era in which the novel is regarded as the literary form por excelencia. Now, a writer is not serious until he or she has published a novel. It's not, if you, you could have all the great collections of short stories you want, but let's see the novel, um, the world says. So, and I have often thought that the essay and the poem are more closely related to each other uh, than the novel. I mean, the poetry, po the poem is a much older form and it has the general Greek meaning of, which means making in general. So part, the title's a pun on that, making personhood. Uh, but the other part is, if you think about poetics as Artesanía de la lengua, which is doing artisanal work with, if, if being an artisan means the matter arrives and you change the matter, which is the way that um, Miseres defines this, this regime of, of uh, artisanal letras, the language arrives and you reshape it to be something else, then poetry is a genre that very forthrightly takes on uh, that tactic. And so I'm interested, I thought of Vestrini as a way of, I thought she was sort of investigating the limits of personhood. Like I don't read her poem as a gloomy apocalyptic poem. I read it as a speculation on where out there is the edge where personhood is formed. And it's maybe a different kind of personhood that's based on a rejection. So that's, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that there's, I'm really interested in what people are doing with language uh, to make these things, but not because I think language is somehow distant from reality. Right, so if I might ask though, um, the difference between making the person and the emergence of the person, because what we have here are women authors, uh, to some extent arguing for um, the, the female, right, as no longer a non-person per se. So is that sort right. of a liminal territory? You know, if if workers or women are demanding entrance, perhaps into the realm of personhood, um, but if the relations of property and ownership are different, right, for those populations, how do you how do you see that with maybe the 
um, the tidal wave metaphor, or you know, is this an expanding per a circle of personhood, just leaving some non-persons at the margins, or is there a different construction? It's a good question. Uh, I think it's a question I'm still trying to figure out the answer to. So all I can tell you is, is like the way so far that I've been trying to think about it. I think that part of what Perry is doing is arguing, and, and she says something interesting in the introduction. She says, in most of the binary questions involving feminism, she says of herself, I come down on the side of what is seen as the conventional feminist perspective. But I often find that the binary itself obscures a lot that's behind it and how the question came to be in the first place. And so one response to that is, I think she's very uncomfortable with the idea of where you would say, for example, we have this concept of personhood. It's ugly how it came into existence, but it's the thing we have. So let's involve as many people in it as possible. If we're going to have persons and unpersons, let's increase the number of persons and decrease the number of unpersons by converting unpersons into persons, which, is, which would be kind of a standard you know, liberation tactic within the framework. I, I think Perry is uncomfortable with the framework of personhood as defined by unpersonhood. Hmm. And I, I think she sees it as inherently problematic. Laura. Hola, Ron. Thank you for your presentation. Um, we can hear you. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay, hola Ron, thank you for your presentation. I, I wanna ask you, what do you think about the context? Because these speeches were like presented in Spain in an official situation with the ministers and everything. And she's talking about Argentina and Peru and presenting um, the, the countries um, to Spain, to Europe. And also um, something that was really interesting is that she connect migration to work right from the yes. beginning people need to to work so they they travel so what do you think that content the, the thing that is an official an official presentation the minister why she choose to say that or in that way to those um officials that's a good it's a good question and and to some degree uh the context of these discourses probably validates the, I think it's Josefina Ludmer uses the phrase uh, tretas del débil to describe the fact that you, when, you're, when you're positioned in a place of structural weakness, then there are certain tactics that you have to use that you might not use if you are operating from a situation of parity. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like strategy. There, there are things you do in a chess game. If you had to begin the game with fewer pieces than your opponent, you would play a different game than you would if you began with the same number of pieces. And so she's in a situation where because of patriarchy, you know, she's, she's, she's short a knight and a rook or something when she begins the chess game. And so she has to play differently. Uh, I agree with that. I, th I think there is, I also think it's probably true, two other contextual things that seem important to me. There is a lot of, worker movement strikes, things like that happening in Europe at the time that she's writing. Those things are happening more in Europe probably than they're happening in Spanish America. And one of the reasons is a relative abundance of work and food in Spanish America as against Europe. Um, and within a few short years, Argentina is going to save thousands, if not billions of Spaniards from starvation by shipping beef there after the Civil War. So the, the economic model in Spanish America relative to Western Europe is one of abundance in this moment as she sees it. And the other thing is Spain has recently had the experience of the war with the United States in 1898. And so is no longer the continental colonial power that it once was. Um, and, there's, and there's very much a self-consciousness of that decline in Spain. And I think she's probably very conscious of both of those things. And finally, I would say, and this is an argument that Ana Pelufo has made um, that I think is really important. If you are dealing with a situation uh, structurally of trying to be 
uh, an intellectual and a woman in the Spanish speaking world in 1900, you need international relationships with other women who are writers. Because one thing you know for sure is that your patriarchal national tradition is not going to be including you. So when the national history of Argentina gets written, if it gets written at that time, it is not going to include Coding de Mato. But she can have a network with other people who are also excluded from their own national pantheons. But you could almost argue that there's a kind of, uh, to use a socialist vocabulary, a women's international that's, that these conferences are helping to foment. And I think that's actually very, a very important factor. And that's, that, those circumstances to me also make this something else, something more than a somewhat disappointing conservative sounding text. Because she's literally carrying this, she's actually speaking these words uh, in an auditorium somewhere or, or at a banquet. It's not something she's, but she's physically present when this message is delivered. I was actually surprised to see um, how, um, how much, um, uh, what's it called, atmosphere or how much fame she, she seems to have when she's being introduced. So it was really interesting to read the introduction as well. And then obviously she establishes herself as um, like among all these big male names, they're all male. They're, the only woman she mentions is in a footnote. Um, so like she also probably had um, this, this need to establish herself not only among thinkers or like historians of uh, these of Peru, but also um, to show that she's, you know, as European as possible or something mm -hmm. for to be taken seriously in, in Europe, like during this, during this trip, because in her other writings, she comes across very differently, which is how, I mean, which is what I, what I knew from her so far, but I don't know, Laura, you might know more about this. Laura is um, uh, finishing a dissertation on uh, 19th century writers and economics, and she's Peruvian, so she's probably um, well acquainted with the topic. And I'm just starting. <laughs> I mean, the reading process. That's why it's so interesting what, what Ron was saying. I'm, I'm definitely in the reading process too. <laughs> of, of working we all are, we all are. Yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely sense that. It's, it's true, I mean, an interesting contrast if you were to read this alongside Las Obreras del Pensamiento which is a talk that she gave in the Ateneo of Buenos Aires. Um, every single person she mentions in that is a woman from Spanish America. If you, were, if you were looking for, I don't know, something somebody might have said 15 years ago, I don't know what writers to include in a course on 19th century Latin American women. You've got two or three syllabi for possible classes on 19th century Latin American women's writers in 1895 at the Ateneo of Buenos Aires. But the, the other thing I would add is that I think I mean, this is, this is an argument I make, uh, people may disagree, but I think people like Corinda Mata were deliberately written out of the literary histories that were written in the 20th century. So I think if you approach her now, you might think, oh, it's this obscure figure because she's not on the doctoral reading list or whatever. And so we're gonna bring her back from the margins, but she was not marginal in precisely that way during her lifetime. Uh, Ave Sinido went through several editions. It was almost immediately translated into English. There's a 1902 edition in English in New York. Um, it was reviewed in Spain and in Latin America and in the U.S. These women, I, I would include Juana Manuela Gorriti. Uh, I would include Mercedes Cabello de Carbonera, um, Soledad Acosta de San Pedro from Colombia were very much well-known international figures in their lives. And then later when national literary histories were written, I think their roles were de-emphasized. Like they were, they were sort of relegated to the footnotes. I think that was a pretty conscious process. I think they know this is going to happen. I think Las Obreras del Pensamiento is written by someone who is preemptively writing the literary history that's going to include the other women's writers before there's a chance for someone else to write the history that won't. That's to me one of the most interesting uh, dimensions of her position historically. 
Okay, everyone, please feel free to always join into the discussion and like also like bring the discussion to um, other questions that you had while you were reading or now. Um, and while you're um, do doing that, I just want to quickly um, complete the footnote I already mentioned to this conversation because um, Claudina Mato Turner um, mentions this um, threefold slogan, Quechua slogan, Ama Julia, Ama Suwa, Ama Keya, which means um, don't be a thief, don't lie, and don't be lazy, basically. And that was for a very long time like treated as a like as a Incayan slogan, but then, um, but now it's being questioned, um, and there's the the actual slogan was actually "Yankai ya chai sonkoi," which means um, work work well, educate yourself, and um, like practice love to the earth, to the gods. Uh, to your Inca, to your Prohimo, and just love, love well. So I think that is a very different setting and she's um, not questioning that because back then obviously it was a different, it was also a very different context. Um, but I just wanted to add that because obviously our um, position now, she's post-colonial and so far as per result, already independent then. Um, but um, but like our decolonial perspective would have to question this, I think a little further. So just adding that to the text. And then- That's a great point. Uh, I, would, I would say the, the etymology or the, the explanation of the words you've just given, the missing element is property, right? The thing she's added is the concept of property in a sense. Right. So what do we do? So how? So Ron, how do what? How does personhood constitute itself, especially if all the people are um, continuously being included, no matter if they're non-binary or whatever, they're being excluded in the concept of personhood, and personhood is not being um, um, def defined by you know having another person as property, then or having property is all. I don't know. Like what is how does pers personhood be how is personhood constituted like do we does work constitute personhood or what about work home, like homeless people or like people uh who don't work right now what 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 happens with them what about general basic income <laughs> like how do we constitute a human being i know i i uh it, it's easy to say this thing is not the thing i want and natural to say, well, what then is the thing you want, right? Like what's the, you've, you've given us the critique, what's the desirable thing? I, I don't see, a, I mean, I think, and maybe this is in a way where Vestrini comes in, in a sense that there's a, One of the things that is most interesting to me about Vestrini, if my theory about her poem is right, is that the day after would logically be translated into Spanish. If I were doing the translation, and I'm, I'm not an expert in English to Spanish translation, I would probably say el dia después and not el dia siguiente. I would translate el dia siguiente as the next day, the way the authors of this poem do. And my theory could be completely wrong. Maybe she's talking about some other nuclear explosion, but I think she's talking about this. The day after implies a complete break. The world is destroyed. What's new? What's the aftermath? It's, it's a focus on the aftermath of a nuclear war. It's, it was designed to raise public consciousness about how bad a nuclear war could be. It seems really interesting, this idea of the next day, the day that follows, just another day for the poets who have been expecting the fireball the whole time, um, who have been there aware of it the whole time. So there's, there's an idea of awareness of the world as a way of being in the world. And so consciousness is part of what Vestrini is about, not as a solution to this problem, but as a way of being open to more solutions and further solutions rather than you know, just having a closed idea of what it constitutes. That's not a very good answer 
uh, it's not a complete answer to the question, but that's sort of where I am with the answer. I think Perry would say, to keep up with the wave analogy, you have to be conscious of the idea that pressing here affects everywhere else at the same time. There, there are not isolated actions. Um, if you're riding on an airplane and you drink a beer, you haven't changed the weight of the airplane. Um, the airplane still weighs whatever it weighed when it took off. You just drank the beer, that's all that happened. And so there's, there's a degree to which the world is that airplane. And so you have to be conscious of the way things are connected. That's as far as I am, to be perfectly honest. That sounds like a very decolonial approach, I think, because like the sole idea of everything being connected and everything being in dynamics and just ch changing forms and appearances um, is pretty much what we talked about in our last session as well, I think. Um, I just, yeah. One other thing occurred to me that I wanted to add. It is possible, of course, that work shapes how we think of personhood but it's also possible that the way we think of personhood shapes the way we think about work. And I was thinking about a, a Kusikanki text that was part of the reading group uh, a few weeks back. And one of the things she talks about is the degree to which um, the perspective of Spanish colonialism operates from a default position that despises physical labor and that also views physical labor as contemptible. And so that there's, a, there's an incompatibility between what work means in Castellano and what work means in Aymara or in Quechua, because it's conceptualized differently. There's a certain form of alienation that's not necessarily present. And I'm, so I do wonder, I was thinking about your discomfort with the word work and it provoked the same discomfort for me we may be having work mean many different things uh, from many different perspectives. We may not be talking about the same word at all. That's all, what you said made me think of that. Yes, that makes total sense. I mean, I was, um, I was also not only the word work and not only the, the, uh, the association that the whole idea of work um, as, as like being liberating, like the, all those Nazi slogans that come up in me are, are what is resonating for me in there. It's forced labor in that right. case. So I associate it to that. But um, another thing I wanted to add is um, the observation in the Vestrini, that Vestrini says, al dia siguiente. Uh, so that is really interesting because it's like al dia siguiente is, is really like how an, how the next chapter would start you know yes. like how a next story how a new story would start on the next day or at the next exactly. day exactly or... so um so it's interesting to see that as basically the opposite of the apocalypse yes yeah i think that's right i think i think if if the, if the place i'm reading it from is correct she's saying apocalypse for us us being the poets is not apocalypse i think that's it it's continuity rather than rupture. Is there, is, is this in this text where she says uh, we have eyes of fire or is it in the, in the fairy text with the witches? Uh, let's see, could be in the parry. There's definitely a section about witches in the parry text. So I think the, I think the, the witches would be from parry. Yeah, the witches definitely, but like there's, I thought there was like some, um, some um, phrasing that she said, we have eyes, we poets have eyes of fire, but maybe let me see. Just, maybe it's just a matter. The fire is part of those who day by day gamble their lives in a horror of solitude. I'm going to look and see if it's missed somewhere else. The other phrase she says is a familiar fire. Right, the, it's, a, it's a familiar fire um, rather than an unfamiliar fire. I found it, I found it. It's in the third paragraph. So okay. it's, it says where she's talking about all those people and then Cesare Pavese, um, Cerro de Yon, Tuviera yes. los ojos del fuego. Oh, he had the eyes of fire. He had eyes fire. of fire, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I had missed that in my reading of the text. 
that's a really good point. Who else wants to contribute? I feel like we only have like 15 minutes left and um, I feel like um, everyone has, as I know you, <laughs> you all have interesting thoughts to add. So um, please, please feel free to, to add to the discussion. I was just- Yeah, sorry, Gloria, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I, I don't know that I have a question as much as a, a comment because I'm thinking about uh, Angel Rama's work in relationship to periodismo and the way that periodismo was a form of democratizing uh, writing. And, and especially for people who were not born into very elite families. And I was wondering about how even though, you know, she may have been or at least the way that I imagine her as this bourgeois, <clears throat> you know, criollo woman, that the fact that she was a woman also, I think kind of made her sensitive to some of the plights that indigenous uh, people faced in Peru. And I, and I keep going back to her novel and the way that she tries to understand the position, the political position of indigenous people or Quechua in this case, and, and her own, or the way that she presents women as also somehow being a, in a subordinate position. And I just think it's interesting that she's both uh, part of this larger democratization of periodismo. And at the same time, I think her position as a, as a woman, despite the contradictions, especially in that text, because um, in obviously Nidos, I think it is so pronounced how contradictory it is to, on the one hand, try to represent women as being subordinate to the husbands or being subordinate to the discipline of, I'm thinking of, of the pseudoscience because in, in the way that also um, she, she seems to represent Quechua people as being subordinate to you know, this pseudoscience as well. So I don't know, it was just, it's just a comment. I, I do teach her in my classes um, on indigenista literature and I, and I always find those contradictions really interesting. Thanks so much for your comment, Gloria. I totally agree uh, about the contradictions. And I was thinking about, I think it's in Ave Sinida. There's a part where um, in a wool trade, uh, a character who's indigenous, who's trading wool with a character who's criollo is taken advantage of economically. And uh, the text goes into incredible detail to explain the economic mechanism that makes this work, like the percentage that's taken, how that affects his yield. And she, her husband was a trader. And one of the things he traded was wool. And he died suddenly and she had to take over the whole business. And so that, that was part of her experience and her journalism came right after that. So I, I do think that's true. I think there's a, there's a certain level of perspective that she has. And I, I teach her too. And one of the reasons I do is because I'm interested in those contradictions. Uh, Antonio. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I was looking at the text again. Thank you, Ronald. Um, th there was just two things, I mean, very much more superficial than, than, than the other comments. Uh, when, when, when previously you met you, we, we were debating about personhood and the binary issue. Uh, it reminds me a book of uh, Roberto Esposito, third person, where, where he, he's even going deeper, where he's saying that even the concept of person without this idea of non-person and person is itself producing um, um, uh, reification of human beings. No? Uh, and, and at the end of the book, it, it's going to, towards the Deleuzean thing, which is a bit obscure. And you're talking about overcoming the person with a third person, you know? But mm -hmm. it, it's interesting, it's interesting how how he's saying that even the concept of person itself, even for the person, it's 
embedded in something which is making human being western human beings objects itself themselves yeah. so even pushing the argument there and that's really and he's going back and he's going back to the I mean, I don't, he's going and actually i read the book in, in 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 the in the argentinian version i mean the spanish version uh and he's going back to, i forget i forgot but he's going back to the latin to the roman he's going back to the also to, to, to germany even i mean the first chapter are amazing the last one is a bit obscure and it was interesting just to go in this conversation and the last thing about and the last thing what, what i really appreciate that at least i read the last quickly the last conferences where she well, it seems that I mean, there is those contradictions, but at the same time, it just reveals us how, for us, we, uh, it's always, as, as thinkers, as researchers, it's always, we are always facing you know, an issue of, of uh, unmasking um, certain relations of power, and there is not even a truth. It's always a, a way of, of unmasking illusions, but we have to be aware that it, there is not a stable truth there. You know, yeah. uh, I, I, for, for, as an example, you no, know, I've noticed at the end she 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 mentioned the law of the evolutionary law, no, a corriente evolutiva de las mujeres. No, but there is a, a kind. I don't know. Huh? Tell me if it's I'm right. There's a kind of positivist uh, scientist. Uh, natural law background you know it seems very for us seem well okay but at the same time it was the, the way of thinking you know and even for us it's always this game of unmasking illusions but we have to be aware that there is nothing stable there we are always to be aware of, of our own reading of of conflict or, or, or reality and i mean this this text is particularly uh, at least the last conference particularly interesting i mean it just sparked me this idea of keep on unmasking illusions without looking for stable truth behind you know i don't know those are those are good really interesting points to me i don't know the uh the book third person i was thinking about the um the theological application of personhood because person is the word at least in english that a lot of Christian theology uses to explain the Holy Trinity. Um, the Holy Trinity is explained as a deity represented in three persons. And so each representation is a different person. And so the idea of personhood being contingent and being something that's a product of a relation with some third term that's beyond it is kind of baked into the cake. Whether that third term is property um, or a deity, um, you know, or law, I would say. I think that an important part of the toolbox that Imani Perry brings to her cultural studies work is that she also has a legal education. So she knows law much better than most people who mention law in, in the context of cultural studies. And so that's, a, I, th I think that's an important, I, I, I didn't read law, but I can at least read Imani Perry and, you know, try to get an idea of, um, how that perspective relates. Uh, yes, I would like to um, maybe not ask a question, but um, make a comment. I am a lawyer and I felt this is the right point to jump in. And I would like to thank you for your very great presentation. And also to Katarina, because I'm constantly learning more and more. And it actually reminded me of a situation where I so I study a lot or I studied a lot on post-colonial theories in law and specifically between states. So the vehicle or the concept I argue around or with or against is always sovereignty as the, you know, the, the personhood of states, so to speak. And um, I was on a panel and someone from the Center of Intersectional Justice here in Berlin was on the panel as well and said to me that law is a tool of oppression. And I felt really offended at that statement because I mean, it's my job. So uh, you're saying that I'm an oppressor basically, but I understand more and more also through reading Perry's uh, text that 
you know, really it's the, it's a very sophisticated um, tool to exclude and to allocate. And I write about personhood all the time, legal person, natural person. It's really, it just flows. I write an article and, you know, it's all the time about cooperation in international business laws being legal persons, you know, of course it's a construct. We, we understood that somehow, but there are certain theories how you can argue against that again. It's the people behind the corporation, for instance, that it's like a substance, like the substance of the corporation is made out of people. So actually it is a person or by the nature of the rights, for example, freedom of science, freedom of speech, if it's a newspaper, um, corporation you say but it it fits the situation so you kind of technically argue around it and I never thought about the step before that prior to you know who gets what right um, is the question who is a person who is brought into the realm of law by having rights and obligations and in international law it's a big debate about corporations multinationals because are they or are they not? They have certain privileges, but they have rarely obligations. Mm -hmm. But a, native, a natural person, it's always assumed, but it wasn't always like that. So we, we actually made distinctions of natural, pers natural personhood even, you know, which is a very common assumption now, every person has rights. But today maybe it shifted um, what rights we deem uh, worthy of protection it's maybe not so much who is a person we acknowledge that but for certain rights we, we differentiate on the basis of rights and for example sexual orientation or family we have a concept of what is a family mm -hmm. and we have a concept of yeah who can get tax tax deduction because they're a couple and they're worthy of being you know protected by the by, the, by tax law and, and, and so forth. So it's really, it, the, the, it, it's still there, this differentiation who is worthy or who has rights and obligations in what regard, but it shifted a little bit to, yeah, also the substance of debating mm -hmm. the substantial rights. But it's for me a very interesting, um, yeah, like a reflection today to, to think about these kind of construction constructs and how they always played into excluding women, excluding other entities from this idea of personhood. And I would really, I, yeah, I want to thank you. And um, I see a lot of parallels to what I've been speaking about and what I've been reading about with regards to states, who is a sovereign, who is a savage state. And it's the same what Perry wrote in her uh, article about savages and, and witches and, and uh, non non men that were not that were not in possession of themselves even that is essentially what it was but there someone else possessed them or there was a relationship of possession established to someone who could who was really sovereign and yeah so thank you very much for that and I really enjoyed. Uh, yeah, being brought into the realm of more interesting texts and and ideas. And yeah, I've spoken already too much, so I'm gonna stop. And thank you, Katalina, of course, as always. Thank, thanks for your comment. Um, I've, I've never, I mean, I work near a law school, but I've never been inside of it, but I have all these ideas about what goes on in law school. And one of the, one of the things that Perry does that I think of as being legal is the use of cases to illuminate a general point and the idea that you kind of need the cases that are most complicated or most on the edges of conceptual definitions in order to make the conceptual definitions clear. Like it's possible to imagine lots of cases that would not be interesting because they don't really test the category boundaries. And so she's finding cases that are, and witches would be one of those cases that's, that's interesting to her. Um, you know, maybe in a narrative way, but even perhaps more importantly, like in a legal way as a kind of test case. Is that true? Is that what people do in law school? I mean, yes, we do. So um, 
like it's always about proving your case you know and how do you prove your case by providing proof that a superior instance has said the same thing okay or has ruled the same way and this is this is your proof in the end of the day <laughs> yeah it's always about the superior who decides and then just gives an orientation you have some some leeway in arguing around certain concepts because we have a lot of terminology that is open like um yeah open for interpretation and for that you to you take courts into consideration legal opinions but you can also bring your own experience into it and that's where why we say it's so important to diversify courts and 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 um, yeah like the, the the profession itself so that more perspectives are considered in the decision making process which also happens on a day to day basis in courts every day that they bring their own understanding of a certain situation into the decision making essentially yeah if nobody else wants to add something i think this was great i was like um like really inspired to think about all kinds of things i've never um <laughs> had this idea of um, myself as property. So I was thinking that in a capitalist world, we're basically all selling our bodies really, right? Like it goes together with like our, like our bodies as, as property or, base, or also our workforce that we sell. Yes. So, um, so I was like, well, in a capitalist world, we're, we're in the end all prostitutes, not sex workers, but like <laughs> prostitutes, <laughs> I don't know. If that makes sense as the last word for this discussion. Yes, I, I read a meme actually on that point. It said, it said that men who, who laugh about women, like it, it was coining also about people being in the army that they're selling their bodies in some way. In some way, we probably all are selling our bodies to a purpose. Yeah, well, or we would really have to redefine um, the value of person of of being in the world and like earn money without having to work or like work or redefine the values of work through decolonial categories that are what we were talking about so i thought this was a really great discussion um you can um still add something if you want ron i would totally give you the last word I just want to say thanks. I've, I've, I've really uh, enjoyed, I've learned a lot from different texts across these different meetings. So thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to present. Wonderful, thank you so much. I always learn so much from all of you. And um, I'm also very much looking forward to our next meeting in two weeks on May 18th. That will be our 14th meeting with the title Decolonization and Revolution. And I've invited um, another colleague from Columbia University her name is Eleni Santim Zeleke. She has written about a book about Ethiopia and theory, revolution and knowledge production, where she also talks about um, ideas of revolution and how we can decolonize them. So um, I will share the readings and um, a PowerPoint presentation. I think that meeting will be a little different. I'll explain in the next email. It would be great to see you there. Thank you so much. To everyone, I think this meeting has interfered a little bit with people's lunch breaks um, as people had to leave. And also I know that Professor Leventhal, for example, he always has to teach and he's like always jumping in and out. But um, this was great. Thank you so much. And I hope I'll see you in two weeks. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks.